Hello and welcome to the first in a series of videos I'm going to be doing, uh, answering some questions from Piazza and also just explaining some general course topics. Um, I hope everyone is doing as well as they can be during these um, interesting times in which we find ourselves. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the fundamental theorem of calculus. I was going to do u substitution because somebody somebody asked about that, but in order to understand that and most of uh, integration, we need a really solid grasp of the fundamental theorem. And it's, it's one of the trickier things. I remember I struggled with this a lot when I was first learning it. So, so this is what we're going to talk about uh, first. U substitution will be next. Um, fundamental theorem, as you know, or as the, the name suggests, uh, is, is very important. It's the biggest theorem in calculus, one of the most important theorems in all of math. Um, and what it does for us is it, it allows us to compute integrals uh, by tying integration into differentiation, which is really, really cool. Um, in the first part of a calculus course, you study how to find an instantaneous rate of change, which seems like you can't do it, but then we use limits and secant lines, it turns out we actually can do it. The next thing we do is we look at finding the area under a curve, and it turns out that um, a curvy curve, you can find the exact area under it if the function is continuous um, using Riemann sums and limits. Uh, limits are wonderful things. And, and so we, we know that in principle we can find the area under a, a nice curve, like a continuous function, but we don't actually know how to do it, or at least how to do it very efficiently. And fundamental theorem gives us gives us a way to actually evaluate integrals. Um, fundamental theorem comes in, <coughs> excuse me, two parts. So part one of the fundamental theorem says that if I have this function, I'm going to call it g of x, and I'm going to define this function to be the integral from a to x of f of t dt. And I'm gonna stop in a minute and explain why we're using this t instead of the x. Um, because this is one of the things that, that really trips people up. Um, I got stuck on it. It's, it's one of the, the more um, sort of subtle things in calculus. Um, if I have this function, g of x, which, what is it doing? Let's, let's think about this for a second. I have the graph of a nice continuous function, f. That's a bad graph. Let's do it. Let's do it something like that. There we go. It's nicer. I have the graph of f, and f is continuous, because we're always assuming that everything's continuous, or else everything just kind of falls apart on us. Um, I don't want b here, I want uh, x. That's going to be next, part two. I have this function, f, and I define this, uh, this other function, g, in terms of this function, f. And what g is doing is it's taking in, as its argument, the, the input, uh, this thing went away on me again. By the way, sorry, I, I, I've been spending the last, I don't know, day or two trying to figure out how to, how to use this program, and I have enough that I can, I can kind of do it, but things screw up and I don't know why, and you're gonna have to sort of bear with me while I stop and, and troubleshoot as we go here. I'm old. Okay, so I have this function f, and I'm defining this function g in terms of it. g is a function which is going to take in a, uh, an x as its argument, this x here, and its output is going to be the area under the curve of f in between a and x. That's what g does. It's, it's a function that takes in the x from here and puts out the area under the curve. Um, and, and a is just some point um, less than x where, uh, where we start the integration. And what the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 says is that the derivative with respect to x of g of x, or g prime of x is actually equal to f of x. Um, so d by dx of the integral from a to x of f of t dt, and we are presently going to talk about this t again, I promise, um, this is equal to f of x. And right here we have, we have um, the, the first link between integration and differentiation. The derivative, the instantaneous rate of change of the function that takes in this x and puts out the area under the graph of f in between a particular point a and this x, the derivative of that function is f of x, the, the original function whose, whose graph we're using to take uh, the area. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a second. Before, before I do that, um, we're going to go back and, and, as promised, talk about this t. Why is it a t and not an x? Um, so I'm going to wipe this stuff and, and talk about that. Um, and again, you're going to have to bear with me because I don't actually have a more efficient way at this point of getting rid of this stuff than just kind of tapping on this back button 
annoyingly. Sorry, sorry. Wait, wait. Oh, and I went. By the way, feel free to make fun of me for for this on Piazza. Um, and and if you know how to a better way to do it as well, I'm open to suggestions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this um this function, uh, g, it go, it's the integral from a to x of f of t dt. And why is it t and not f? or not x. Why is it f of t and not f of x? Everybody wants to know this. Um, I wanted to know this years ago when I was learning calculus for the first time. I was taking uh, Matt 137, and I asked my TA about this, and he said something which a lot of people say, which is that t is a dummy variable. Um, and that was, he was, he was a really, really good TA. Um, uh, he's a prof now, but, um, you know, one of the better ones. But but that, that, that piece of insight that it's a dummy variable, that was just completely unhelpful. Uh, did not help me understand. Uh, I don't think it really helps anyone understand, but um, that's kind of the standard thing that people say. And it's true, it is a dummy variable. We're going to come back to that at the end and see why we say it's a dummy variable. But in order to um, to figure out sort of sort of why it has to be a t instead of an x, because that's what people mean when they say, uh, why is it t? They mean, why, sh why sh shouldn't it be x? Um, what we're going to do is consider, um, this, this is sort of a general math thing. If you want to know why something in math has to be true, um, think about what would happen if it was false. If it wasn't true, what would happen? And uh, things will blow up in your face. The point is something will go wrong. There will be badness. There'll be a contradiction or something will, won't work. Something that you wanted to work won't work. So, uh, and that will show you that the thing has to be true. Um, and that's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to see what would happen if it was x instead of t. But uh, the first thing to notice, and this is a, a comment about mathematical notation in general, is that it, it's a way of conveying information. When they say it's a dummy variable, what they mean is that the t, the t doesn't matter. It could be s, it could be a, uh, q, it could be anything. The information that's being conveyed in this is, the, which it means uh, the important bits, is the a and the f. x is the variable, but a and f are fixed. a is a point, it's down here, and f is a function, there he is. And so this notation is saying, give me the area Take, take an x and give me the area under the graph of f in between a and x. And so the, the point is that the t doesn't come into it at all. The t and the dt do not, do not matter in this case. Um, why do we have the dt there? It's because when we, take, um, when, we, when we do Riemann sums, we're multiplying by this, this quantity delta x, which as we pass to the limit, turns into a dx, which is an infinitesimal, and um, I'm not sure how, how much in depth we're going get, to get into infinitesimals, but I'm definitely going to tell you, um, I'm going to talk about infinitesimals at some point in a really, really informal way, which is completely uh, not the way that they actually are, but will we'll help you understand it. Um, in math, we say that's hand-wavy. We're going to be very, very hand-wavy about infinitesimals. But the point is that that's why we want to keep the dt in there, to sort of remind us of what we're doing. Um, I'll sort of link, I'll link back to this in the Riemann sum video. But uh, for those of you who didn't know, this... I'll try orange, maybe. I'm getting tired of these colors. This this elongated um, integral sign is actually an S. It comes from from an S. It's it's a it's a stretched out S, and that stands for sum. And that, together with this dt, are uh, are kind of reminding us that what we actually are doing is taking the limit of Riemann sums, um, where again this the limiting value of the delta x, the the change in x, is this dx. So that's why we're kind of keeping it in there. But the, the t doesn't, doesn't play any role, doesn't add any information. Only the f and the a matter, and then the x is the variable. Um, but nevertheless, um, to, to sort of demonstrate why, why it can't be x, which again is what people really want to know, we're going to sort of think about what would happen if it were x. So let's, let's rewrite this. What if I, I wrote instead integral from a, so g, g of x is now the integral from a to x, uh, f of x dx. Um, and so now this is the function that is taking taking in an x and spitting out the area under the curve in between a and x, or, or that's what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and my thing keeps going away, and I don't know why, and I'm sorry, but this is probably really annoying. Um, I'll try to figure this out uh, for future videos. No promises, though, um, on account of, of me being old and sucking at technology. So... So what, in particular, because this, this g is a function, I want to be able to evaluate this function. I want to take uh, some number c, if I have, like in here, a point c in between a and x, I want to evaluate g of c, and I want to get out of this function, I want to get 
the area under the curve of f from a to c. That's what I wanted to get out of it. But if I, if I have an x in here instead of a t, what I, what's going to happen when I plug in c? Well, I'm plugging in c for x at the top of the integral, so I have to plug it in everywhere, everywhere else as well. Everywhere I see an x, I have to plug in uh, a c. And I'm going to do this in a different color just to sort of emphasize it. So this is my f. And now I'm going to put, I'll put the d here, and maybe in this kind of mauve thing. Now I'm going from a to c, f of c, dc. Yeah, that looks kind of cool. Um, and so what is this? Well, before I was doing the up here, I was doing the area under the graph of f uh, from a to x. Now that, and, and so this, the, the idea is that what was changing, what was kind of the variable of the x, uh, uh, or of the f, was the t. x was the variable of the g here. And again, this is very informal and hand wavy the way I'm talking about this stuff, but, but I really think this will help you understand it. Um, so so I, I, here I was saying, take the, put the x into the g and give me the area underneath f. So, so when the x was plugged in, when the x changed, the t didn't have to change. Now, when I plug in a c for the x, because I put an x here, and here, I have to plug in the c as well. And now this, this is no longer this, this function f of t, this kind of changing variable uh, function here. This now is the constant function f of c. f of c is just a number. Okay, that's f evaluated at c. That is this. That is this. This is f of c right here. And so now that I've plugged this in, if I'm going to treat the notation the same way, say so this is giving me the area from A to C under the graph of whatever is here, well, what is here? Now this, this, is, this is F of C. This is the constant function F of C. So what it's actually going to give me is this. It's going to give me the area under the curve of this constant function F of C in between A and C. And what is that, that area going to be? Well, it's going to be f of c times c minus a. That's just the base times the height. That's going to be the area that this thing gives me. And that might, uh, coincidentally, be the, the same as the area that I was looking for, this orange area under the graph of f in between a and c. But it's, it's very unlikely, and we don't want to take that chance. We don't want to kind of roll those dice. So we're going to stick in the t instead there and say it's a dummy variable. Don't worry about it. Uh, all this notation is telling me is um, give me give me the area under the graph of this function f here in between the points a and x, and I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to clear this stuff um, because this is getting this is a gigantic mess. I just noticed this, but I, I think we kind of made the point, and we can move on from this. So let's let's go back. Um, I don't know five hundred. Actually, you know what? I'm just gonna clear the entire thing as much as it pains me. Um, let's get rid of there. Okay. All right, so, and now, now we lost our banner, but that's all right. So, fundamental theorem of calculus, part one, is telling me that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to x of f of t dt is equal to f of x. And now we kind of are, are sort of confident about um, y to t and not an x. Hopefully, hopefully we're, we're satisfied that that's okay. Um, and now let's get some kind of intuition for it. And I want to emphasize once again that we're being extremely, extremely hand wavy about this. This is not how it actually is at all. This is just a way of thinking about it to help you kind of get a get an intuitive feel for it. Um, and this this I find really helps students, um, uh, especially when we get down the road and we start we 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 confront the boogeyman of volumes of rotation. This is what really helps people understand that, even though it's it's hand wavy and and completely informal. Um, so I'm going to, again, have my graph of f, and I'm going to be thinking about what is this, what is this function, this function g of x, it's this thing. g is taking, once again, it's taking in an x here, and it's spitting out the area under the curve of f in between a and x. And and g is the limit of so so if I evaluate uh, uh, if I actually wanted to find this area using Riemann sums and we'll talk about this more in the Riemann sum video I'd be taking a limit of Riemann sums, um, and so again total hand waviness but we can kind of we can kind of think of Riemann sums um, so I'll just um, 
Actually, I don't, I don't want to actually start drawing Riemann sums. It's probably getting too much off topic. But we can think about Riemann sums as as taking infinitesimally thin slices and and adding them all up, taking an infinite sum of infinitesimally thin slices. Um, again, totally not what's actually happening, but that's that's a useful way to think about it. And so so similarly, I can think about I can think about this this function g as taking these infinitely thin slices, these slices, uh, these little rectangles under the graph of f, which have a width of uh, dx, this infinitesimal width, dx, and they have height f of x. Um, and this thing, this thing kind of sweeps out the area. It starts, it kind of starts down at a, and then it moves up to this point x, and I take this this infinite sum of infinite, infinitely thin slices and add them all up, and that's, that gives me the actual area. And once again, not actually what's happening, just a, a helpful way of thinking about it. So think about it that way. Um, but it's not actually that way. Now, if I want to think about this d by dx, so d by dx of g of x, well, I'm asking myself how much, this, this is the instantaneous rate of change of g, at the point x. So I'm asking myself, how much is g changing at this point x? What is the instantaneous rate of change? What is the, what is at, at this particular instant, how much is being added to the area under the curve of the graph of x, uh, of f? And the, the answer to this, again, not actually how it's happening, uh, but I can think of this as this, this sort of, if I, I kind of pull it out here, this infinitely thin kind of little stick thing at the edge here getting added on to the area. This thing, whatever this is, that is the rate of change of the function g at the point x. Um, that, that's the infinitesimal rate of change. That's that's the, the increment. That's how much is being added on to it at this point. Um, and this, this is an infinitely thin rectangle with a width of dx and a height of f of x. The value of the function at the point so this, this f of x here, and we're, we're kind of imbuing it with this infinitesimal width dx, and then, and then summing all these things up. And so kind of, again, total hand waviness, but kind of the last one to get added on at that point x is this one, and it has, it has um, an, this infinitesimal area, f of x times dx. And so, so what, is this, what is this saying? This is saying that the the um, sort of increment that's being added to the function is is this guy, um, and so and, and what is let's go back up to our our d by dx of g of x thing here, which we started with. Well, this the derivative. So the the notation we've seen in this course dy by dx for the derivative of a function y with respect to x. We can think about this as the ratio of an infinitely uh, an infinitesimal change in y to the infinitesimal change in x that caused it because y is a function of x. Um, and so and what is this? This is the limit as uh, should we yeah let's let's, uh, let's actually take the time to go a little bit back. This if uh, y is equal to f of x then d this is annoying, then dy by dx is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. We've all seen this. Um, but, and we'll, well, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll make a separate video on this, but if, maybe I come over over here, if I notice that in this formula, the h is actually how much the x has changed, um, so it's it's a little change in x um, around around the point where we're taking the derivative. Well, I can set h is equal to the delta x, and f of x plus h minus f of x. This is actually the delta y. This is the the infinitesimally small change in y. That's the infinitesimally small change in x. So I can actually write this thing as the limit as delta x goes to zero of delta y over delta x, and that limits out to dy by dx, which we call the instantaneous rate of change. 
And so what does that have to do with the thing that we were just talking about? Um, well, if, if I have this, this g um, of x, I'm taking, I'm t and I want to find the derivative of this, I'm taking the limit, I should do this in, in yet another color, um, there we go, um, say, uh, this light blue, I don't think I've used that, I'm taking the limit as delta x goes to zero of, now it's going to be g of, or I should keep the notation the same, delta g over delta x. This is dg by dx, the limiting value. And what have we seen? We've seen that the, the change in g, the infinitesimal change in g, is this thing here, is this infinitesimally thin slice kind of thing, infinitesimally thin rectangle, which has infinitesimal area f of x times dx. So that, this, this is actually delta g. g is the area under the graph of uh, f in between a and x, and so the infinitesimal change in g is this, this infinitesimally thin stick that we're kind of adding on at the end there. Um, so what's that telling us? That's telling us that dg, dg by dx, is equal to, uh, or rather, sorry, go back here. Let's go, I want to do it this way. dg is equal to f of x dx. That's a delta g. And so the, the derivative, this g prime of x, which is the dg by dx, well, I divide both sides by dx. And again, hand waviness everywhere. I end up with these things, quote unquote, canceling. That's not actually how it works, again. But I end up with, I can think of this as these things canceling, and I'm ending up with f of x as the instantaneous rate of change of this function g. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully that gives you kind of an intuitive idea of fundamental theorem part one. Um, although, again, I can't stress this enough, that is, that is hand waviness of epic proportions, not actually what's going on. Okay. <clears throat> and there I, I erased all the evidence. Um, like it never happened. Okay, so that was, that was part one. That was FTC. Uh, part one is d by dx of integral from a to x, f of t dt is equal to f of x. Part two is going to tell me, now, so this, this was, by the way, this was telling us that there's this relationship between integrals and derivatives. The derivative of the integral is the function, and so the, the integral of the derivative of a function is going to be the original function. Um, and this is, this is kind of what's translating into um, indefinite integrals. Um, that's why we're, we're writing for the antiderivative of f of x, we're writing uh, this, this indefinite integral sign. This means antiderivative, antiderivative. Um, so what's, what's fundamental theorem of calculus part two gonna tell us? Well, that's, that's a way for evaluating definite integrals. So that's a way for eval uh, evaluating the integral from a to b of f of x dx now. And now the x comes back into it because we don't, we don't need a dummy variable. Um, it could be anything again, but the point is we don't, have to, we don't have to use a different variable than we used at the top of the uh, integration, um, the upper bound of integration, like in g there. Um, what fundamental theorem part two is telling me about this thing is that this actually is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a uh, where capital F is any antiderivative of little f. And that's the crucial thing, is that capital F can be absolutely any antiderivative of little f. This is really powerful, because this means that if I'm trying to find the area under a curve of a function like this f of x here, in between two points, a and b, if I want this thing, by the way, this, this here, this is a number. This is a function, or sorry, this, well, actually they're both functions, but this is a function. The indefinite integral is a function. The definite integral is a number. It's the area under the graph of f in between a and b. Um, this is telling me that if I can find any antiderivative of this f function, then all I have to do is evaluate it at the endpoints at the, the bounds of integration and subtract. Um, and this is, this is really powerful. This lets me actually, actually um, evaluate definite integrals. Um, 
and th this, this this part we're actually going to prove. So what we did uh, before um, was was total hand wavy um, intuition kind of forming. It was not a proof of any kind. I can't emphasize that enough. What we're we're going to do now is that assume that we know that this one is true. Um, by the way, the proof of that. Um, is it involves epsilons and deltas, and it's 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 much more difficult than the proof of part two. So we're we're not gonna we're not gonna go there, um, but we are gonna actually prove part two, assuming part one, and we will do that right now, and maybe that's kind of like some saving grace for this video that there's an actual, an actual proof in it. Um, but we do need we do need to assume part one for this. Okay, um, and I'll put back in this this thing here. So. Um, part two, and now I'm switching from from normal numbers to Roman numerals, and just pretending that's not happening at all. Um, so I want to show that the integral from a to b f of x dx is capital F of b minus capital F of a, where capital F is any antiderivative of f. And for the purposes of this, I'm going to remember that I called this thing, oh, that's gross, sorry, I called this thing g of x, and the key insight to this is that because f and g, I'm assuming that I have this capital F, which is an antiderivative of little f, because capital F and g, capital G here, are both antiderivatives of f, that means they only differ by a constant. That's a thing, that's a thing which is true, um, we won't prove it right now, but that, that is absolutely true, and there's kind of, um, that, that's pretty intuitive. If you take the derivative of a function, you get you get another function, um, and the constants go away. If there was a constant term to your function, it goes away, and so um, and this is why when we integrate, we have to put back that that c. Everybody forgets the plus c, um, what we call the constant of integration. So so we know we know that because these functions have the same derivative, they differ by a constant. So we know. I don't know what just happened there. I'm gonna. Well, okay. Okay. Uh, just just okay. Um, I know that g of x is actually f of x plus some constant c, which is yet to be determined. And by yet to be determined, I mean we're going to determine it right now. How are we going to determine it right now? Well, we're going to notice that because g, this function g, is the area under the graph of f from a to x, g of a has to be 0. And that, that, that should make sense. The area under a graph at a particular point, so this is my f, if this is, for the love of, cooperate, okay, there we are, a. So this thing here, this line segment, is the area under the graph of f from a to a. And what is the area of a line segment? It's zero, because the area is the length times the width, and this thing has no width. So if I plug in a to g, I get zero. And I also get, since g was equal to f of, a, uh, f of x plus f of c, I end up with f of a plus c. And then I can rearrange this and say that c is equal to negative f of a. And now I'm almost done. You can probably see the finish line fast approaching, but nevertheless, um, the now, now I can evaluate the, the definite integral. So the integral from a to b of f of x dx, or it could be f of t dt, again, it does not matter at all. Well, that's, that's evaluating this function g, this function g at the point b. And we know that g is equal to, I'll do this over here, g of x is equal to capital F of x minus capital F of a, which is this function c, uh, or the, this constant c. So this thing here, this definite integral from a to b of f of dx, f, x, f of x dx is g of b, which is f of b minus f of a. And that's kind of underwhelmingly easy. Um, and again, this this is this, I'm kind of taking the path of least resistance here because proving part one is is a significant undertaking, whereas this one follows quite naturally from it. But nevertheless, that that is the the reason that we can um, this fundamental theorem of calculus, both parts part one and part two, which follows from it, is is the way that we can actually evaluate definite integrals. 
I have, I'm trying to find the area under a curve of some function in between two points. All I do is, is find any antiderivative of that function and evaluate it at the endpoints and subtract. And by the way, this, you'll see this notation, um, capital F of X, and then this line and this B and A, this means, this means this. Um, there's various notations for this, but I think that's the, the most common one. Um, so that's, that's fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, and we're going to see immediately the, um, the application of this to, to use substitution, to integration by substitution, where we're going to be working backwards from the chain rule. The chain rule is a way of differentiating, so you, and, and use substitution is the corresponding method of integration. We see here this, this very close uh, relationship between integration and differentiation. They're kind of opposites. They undo each other. And so, so if we want to find integrals, if we want to evaluate integrals, we need antiderivatives. Um, and so it kind of makes sense that we're going to be using differentiation rules to, and working backwards to find antiderivatives. Uh, and that will be in the next video. So um, I hope you guys, I hope this was helpful and not too annoying with all, with all the screw-ups. Um, and I will see you in the, the use substitution video shortly.